Well, thank you so much for having us. It's quite an honor to be here with you. Um, and thank you for, for coming on out. <laughs> Welcome to Washington. I could take it on small doses. So this is good. This is good. I've been here a decade. You'll le you learn to love it. It's warmer here. It is warm. Yeah. Well, I, I want to jump right in uh, and talk about my favorite topic, the, uh, the labor market. So U.S. employers have added jobs for 102 straight months. That's the longest stretch on record. The unemployment rate is the lowest since the late 1960s. So are we experiencing the best labor market in a half century, Eric? Uh, no, <laughs> let me, but let me, I mean, there's two parts that we're going to talk about, I assume, through our discussion tonight. And the first is like a, the traditional cyclical ebbs and flows of economies, and we are in a nice flow part of an economy where the economy's been expanding for, you know, almost a decade and change now. And, you know, U.S. recessions are becoming farther and farther apart after the, the, the 1980, uh, you know, basically around the early 1980s. And in non-recessionary periods, labor markets today are usually better than yesterday. And if we continue an expansion tomorrow, they will be better tomorrow. And that's the cycle part of things. So when you're in an expansion, things tend to progress during the cycle, and then you go into a recession, and they retrench, and then you start the process over again. What I am, you know, concerned with in a lot of my work is more the trend as opposed to the cycle. And so when we see things like the unemployment rate being at historic lows, we have to then also ask, well, what about participation rates in the economy? And not, you know, when you hear participation rates in the newspaper, how many people are working, you know, even looking for work or working, we usually think, well, the economy's aging or there's students, let's throw all that away. And let's just look at people who I'm going to call prime age, with no offense to anybody in the room. And these are going to be things between the ages of 21 and 55, people after some most bachelor schooling and prior to the start of an uptick in retirement. And so during that period, you know, for that age range, the participation rate for men in today, you know, 2019, is lower than it was in 2007 and much lower than it was in 2000. So in 2000, if you were a man between the ages of 21 and 55, about 90% of us worked. Okay, in 19, or 2007, on the precipice of the Great Recession, it was about 88.5% of us worked. Right now, it's about 86% of us working. So we're about three and a half percentage points below the participation rate for prime age men today. And if we condition that on skill, so those of us who have less than a bachelor's degree, the decline has been even sharper. So while the unemployment rate is low, this participation rate is also low, but it's low in a historical sense. Now, certainly it's better than it was in 2018, and 2018 was better than it was in 2017, and that's the cycle part of things. And tomorrow, it'll, if we don't no go into recession, it'll be even, you know, the participation rate will be even better, because um, that's the way the cycle works. But the trend part, you know, we're a decade after the Great Recession, and yet we haven't returned to the same participation rates. So what's going on with those, those youngish men yeah. and, and, uh, yeah. and those in their prime working years? Is, yeah. it, is it opioids? Is it video games? Well, is it comfy basements? <laughs> I think you know, that's a small part. I've worked on this. It's yeah. a small part. For of sure. This. And, you know, I just want to say one other thing before we go. So how do we get low participation rates and low unemployment rates? And I think this is kind of an issue that has economists like me who work on these issues, you know, more concerned. The unemployment rate only measures those people who don't have a job who actively want to be looking for a job. And the participation rate doesn't condition. It's basically, by definition, those who aren't working or those who aren't working for, or looking for a job. So there's a large gr group of prime age men and some prime age women now. The women is a little harder because there's been trends of women's participation rising for almost a century into the early 2000s, and that's reversed now um, as well. But prime age men and women are working less now, particularly low skilled, and they're not even looking for a job. So the question then is, what are they doing? And what has been the cause of this, this, this phenomenon? And you know, one feature I think is first order important is kind of what you hear about in the news, which is you know, automation in general particularly in one industry, the manufacturing industry, 
has displaced many low-skilled workers. And so how do I know this? Because if I go and look at participation rates in places that look like Detroit, they've declined much more than places that look like San Francisco. So in places that were heavily manufacturing, there is a large decline in people's participation. They're not looking for jobs and they're not working, and they're sitting idle. And if you just put it in your mind, a scatter plot of how important manufacturing was in your town in 2000 versus the decline in the participation rate from 2000 till today, it is a sharp, um, which way do do? sharp negative line in the sense that the places that were manufacturing was the most important. It's the places where participation has fallen the most. So manufacturing, this autumn, you know, and we can talk about how much of it's trade or how much of it is uh, automation. I'm gonna, I'll tell you how I get to this conclusion in a second, but I'm just going to jump to this conclusion. Most of it is automation. And as a result, the certain types of skills, my dad was a manufacturer. He's passed now. But if my dad was alive today, he had a certain skill set of work in the assembly line. And when those jobs go away, it is not easy for people like him to migrate to the parts of the economy where jobs are growing. So think about, you know, more high-skilled services, or even low-skilled cognitive services. My dad would have been an awful greeter at Walmart. Would have been miserable. There's no, nothing pleasant about it. <laughs> Shop someplace else um, if he was at the door. So that type of skill set is, is something that is harder for, for workers to migrate to. And so then they're sitting idle. And so, you know, I'm pausing here because in my mind, this is something that not only I study in most of my recent work, but it is something that also makes me concerned going forward. Because it is, again, a decade after a recession where we thought that was the defining feature of the labor market since 2000, the Great Recession. That is not what I fear most. So if I look back on the history of the 2000 to 2020, the Great Recession was important, and it was very painful and short-lived and salient. But the long-lived part is this increase in uh, automation, this decline in a certain sector of the economy that had large employment uh, uh, outcome, uh, opportunities for certain types of workers in certain types of places, and those jobs went away. So. Talk us through that a little bit. You know, we hear in Washington a lot of talk about trade, a lot of talk about globalization. You know, so, so you're telling us it's about automation. So yeah. those jobs weren't lost overseas. They weren't lost to China. Yeah. Talk to us about that. It, so let me just set a fact first. So we're all in the same place. You know, between 2000 and today, we've lost 7 million manufacturing jobs. Most of those losses occurred from 2000 to 2004, and then again from 2007 to 2010. So think in your mind, like manufacturing employment, it's like a step, step function in the time series. It was kind of atrophying from 1980 to 2000. You know, the things that Michael Moore was writing, you know, movies about, you know, the decline of Flint, Michigan, we lost 2 million manufacturing jobs from 1980 to 2000. Okay, so keep that in perspective. It, it, it declined. From 2000 to 2010, you know, we lost a little over 7 million. We've got a little rebound now. That is massive in a historical context. Uh, in a, a historical context. So what started that decline, and I do believe trade was a big part of it initially. So you know, the increase in China in particular of its manufacturing sector into the world uh, market started around 2000. China entered the, the, the WTO, um, huge amount of exports, and that hit manufacturing sectors hard. But here's where I know it's not all China. So if you ask what happened to manufacturing output in the US between 2000 and 2007, it went up by like 8%. So we are getting more output with less workers. Now, how is that happening? The sector itself 
was transforming through this automation process. Now, it might be the case that the increased competitive pressures from China induced US manufacturers to automate. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Once the automation has taken place, erecting trade barriers is not going to bring back the manufacturing sector to where it was in 2000. So the US manufacturing sector has been fundamentally altered, altered in a way such that now jobs being created in manufacturing tend to be a higher level of skills than the jobs that were lost in the early 2000s. So by having the decline, you know, that all these jobs that we lost in a certain part of the skill distribution, they've kind of now coming back in engineers, or not even people with bachelor's degree, even though the bachelor's share of manufacturing is increasing in its workforce, but even more skilled labor. You need a precision welder. You need some sort of certificate to do that where you didn't have a certificate in the past to, to work the assembly line. So while trade might have been a shock initially, I do believe automation has been a, a key part of it. And last thing I'll say related to this, which is the sectors for which trade, the man, US manufacturing sector was most exposed to trade. So the places where China was producing the same type of good. So think about those types of manufacturers in the US. So think about it, example, you know, China was producing toys, they didn't do as much on furniture. So think about the toy manufacturing sector relative to the furniture manufacturing sector in the US. The automation that has taken place in toys has been larger than it has been in uh, furniture during this time period. And um, you, measure you measure it by you know, output per worker. Okay, so the amount of output divided by the number of workers. And output per worker has risen more in toys than it has in, uh, is in furniture, which kind of suggests maybe trade was the impetus of originally, but that competitive pressure created um, a huge amount of um, automation that has resulted. So, so we've seen this, this automation create this disruption. So we have a question. I think we're going to do a few minutes first, and then we're going to take questions a lot in, the, in, in probably like five minutes. What do you think, 10 minutes? Yeah. Yeah, let's get to the questions pretty soon. But yeah. I want to follow up real quick yeah. on, um, you know, so automation has had this huge disruptive effect on uh, the labor market, but, you know, haven't we we've been here before? I mean, weren't we all farmers at one point? Yeah, so. that's why I like to So if you think about a century ago, you know, most of us as the economy would have been in agriculture. And then a robot comes along. We call the robot a tractor. Um, but that tractor tremendously automated the farming sector. And there was a whole bunch of workers then who got displaced from the farming sector and life went on. Okay, now, a lot of this took place right around the Great Depression, so it's hard to see exactly the, secular, the, the structural versus secular, uh, uh, cyclical changes at that time. But here's what we do know, that the employment to population ratio for men, okay, women were growing pretty much throughout this period. But for men, stayed robust, you know, for the most part over decades. It declined during the Great Depression, but by, you know, after World, World War II, you know, participation rates were, were pretty back to high levels, 93%, 94% for prime age men. So what makes structural change, automation, in the farming industry potentially different than automation in the manufacturing industry? And I think there are two things that I've been th thinking about. One I think is pretty well established, and then the second is something I'm working on now. So the first of those is that when a sector gets hit with a technological shock, how it much it shows up in non-employment depends upon what other sectors are growing and what is the skill mix, the skill requirements of those sectors. So my guess is, again, my dad wasn't alive then, but my dad would have been a farmer in like 1890 if he was living back then. If farming went away and a manufacturing plant opened up, my dad's skill set on the farm and the skill set in the manufacturing sector weren't too different from each other, that that migration would have been a little bit easier. Today, manufacturing has gone down, 
But at the same time, the jobs that are growing in the economy have a very different skill demand. The manufacturing sector, the farming sector are highly routinized jobs, highly manual type of uh, labor, where the jobs we're creating today are a little bit more in the service sector. Sometimes there's a little bit more, you know, brawn is not rewarded as much in the current labor market as potentially it was in the past. So the gap between the skill mix of the declining sectors and the skill mix of the growing sectors is going to be important for how much of it shows up in non-employment versus just reallocation to other, to other sectors. Now, if there is a skill gap between the sectors, then the next question is, is how easy is it for the worker who doesn't have skill to go get the skills needed to work in the growing sectors? In, you know, one thing that I'm thinking about now, and I don't know how it's going to play, I don't know if it's going to be able to prove it in my, my research or at least in my own mind, but here's something I'm going to conjecture that I'm thinking about. That it was easier for the marginal person to get skill in 1930 or 40 than it is for the marginal unskilled person to get skill today. Now, why is that? There might be other stories about the cost of education and things of that nature, but at a simple level, there's just a selection story at play. So in nine, you know, 1900, very few of us were skilled. Most of us were unskilled. So when a skill shock occurs, and if the world is heterogeneous in people's ability to get skill, maybe because some of us are higher latent ability and smarts, maybe some of us have a higher disutility of going to, to, to school, maybe some of us study better than others, in a world where very few of us are skilled and there's that heterogeneity in the population, when the skill shock occurs, the person who's going to adjust is going to be a person who has a relatively low cost of skill acquisition. But as more and more of us get skilled, the pool of the unskilled becomes more and more selected that if you weren't going to go get to school in you know, 1990 when the skill premium is 50%, it might not be the one going to get skill when the skill premium is 52% mm -hmm. or 54%. So the pool of the unskilled might just be harder and harder to train, you know, by, you know, their ability, their cost, whatever it is. You know, the school I went to, only about 40% of us growing up went to um, a four-year college. Okay, so, you know, which is the U.S. average, only 40% of my generation, or a little less than 40% of my generation than the men, actually go get a bachelor's degree. Okay, for men of my cohort, it's about 34, 34%. And my school was probably average in that perspective. If you took all the people I went to school with and dropped them into a four-year college or a degree program or something at the age of 20, I don't know how many of them would have been as successful, either for innate talent or desire. That's not what they wanted to do. And so as a result, it's a little harder to adjust. And so that means as the economy has been getting much more mature, we need people to get skilled to get these jobs that were created. It might be harder to do that today than it was in the past. So for those two reasons, the skill gap between the skills of growing and shrinking sectors might be sim more similar to in the past than it was today. And to the extent that they were different, it might have been easier for the person to get skill on the margin in the past than it was today. Just in the back, I'll, I'll take another question in a second, but for men, the propensity to go to college has been relatively flat across cohorts from my cohort, so people who are in their mid-40s now, to people who are in their mid-20s now. Whereas for the century before that, college completion rates, four-year college completion rates, we've been growing pretty steadily for almost a century. For women, had has been increasing. So women have increased, surpassed men on their college completion rates and still have been increasing relatively. For something about men where, for whatever reason, it has slowed down um, relative to trend. It's something I find puzzling. And again, when I'm projecting the future out, these are things that don't make me overly comfortable. So back to your original question. I don't think the labor market is at its all time. 
healthiest, <laughs> particularly if for the low skilled. That was a long, what do we have, 40 minutes just to get to the answer. Yeah. <laughs> That's the academic way of doing things, That's right? That's exactly, exactly. Um, let me ask you one more kind of hot button question and then we'll definitely open up to the audience here. Um, but I want to uh, talk a little bit about immigration policy and this is basically a two part question. I want you to sort of set the baseline first. Historically, what have the effect what effect have immigrants had on native born workers, job prospects, and wages? It's a, it's a far you know, more nuanced answer than I could give in a short time, but I will try. So again, when I think about immigration and policy in my mind, I think about two types of immigration. There's high-skilled immigration and low-skilled immigration. High-skilled immigration is where the immigrants from, who come in tend to be at the upper part of not only their own country's distribution, but our country's distribution. The people who come into you know, uh, our PhD programs or our uh, bachelor's program, and they stay. And those tend to be highly productive, highly um, uh, you know, successful within our labor market. And that creates jobs for all of us, just like you know, when we create Microsoft or a Google, those create jobs. So having highly talented people come in can have spillovers both historically and going forward, um, particularly at the top of the skill, skill distribution. The bottom of the skill distribution is a little more nuanced. So in some sense, there's a belief that low skilled migration comes in could actually reduce the wages of low skilled workers just from a supply effect, more of a given Apples lowers the price of apples. More low-skilled workers lowers the price of low-skilled workers. When we look for that in the data, the data is relatively mixed. And some of the stories that have occurred around that is why low-skilled labor tends to move to sectors where there's not a lot of supply for domestic workers. Think about the agriculture sector. Um, and so while, yes, low-skilled workers have some downward pressure on wages, in theory, it's been hard for us to find strong, large evidence. They might exist, but the evidence don't seem to be large on the, the, the wage effects for low-skilled workers. Now, in today's environment, a lot of the places where the employment to population ratio is the lowest are not places that had a huge influx of immigrants relative to the national trend. There's not a huge amount of you know, immigrants going to Des Moines. Okay, or Bakersfield, or you know Detroit. There are some, okay, but it's not as is not as as much as it is in San Antonio, or you know San Diego, or some of the other uh, other cities where immigration might be more of an issue. So, okay, so that's kind of the the broad thing. In the past, high skilled workers, I think, are by far the evidence is net positive for the U.S. economy. Um, and low-skilled workers, in theory, should be reducing worker low-skilled wages, um, but the evidence has been hard to find. Has there been any evidence yet of the current administration's um, policies or stance towards immigrants that's had any effect on, on the labor market that you can see in the last couple of years? I have not. Um, it provides nice variation for us <laughs> in the sense that it was a large and relatively unexpected shock that stopped flows of people, you know, at least made it more difficult for flows to come in. I, again, for most of us, we've had hard to find effects of immigration on the labor market prior to this. I don't imagine we will find much of an effect on the labor market otherwise. Now, it doesn't mean that people don't think it could have an effect. You know, when you're losing your job, and you're not, you know, used to be a manufacturer, you had a manufacturing, given its unionized status, its ease of entry conditional on being a unionized status, people in these sectors had, you know, middle class lives by sure. You know, manufacturing wages, if you've been there 15, 20 years, you were definitely in the upper half of the wage distribution of the US. And when those jobs go away, you are no longer there. And so I could see how people might not understand why that has happened and feel other events around the world, like globalization or immigration, um, might be responsible for those uh, forces where they feel their life, rightfully so, their 
life wasn't as good as it was 20 years ago, either them personally or compared to their parents. And so, you know, around the world, not only in the U.S., you see lots of places where manufacturing used to be prominent move towards, I would say, more anti-trade, anti-immigration stances. And that occurs in Europe um, just as much as it does in the U.S. All right, let's take some questions uh, from the audience. We'll start well back there. Way back. Way back. You're up in the first, you had You're your question up five minutes in. Oh. <laughs> oh. All right, that, yeah, right there, right there. You can go and then we'll oh, go to the okay. gentleman over there. He, his, his head was up since the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, good. Is that on? How are you doing? Good. good. How are you? Good. Thank you. So uh, tie what you've just said to the rise of white nationalism and uh, Donald Trump, number one. Hmm. Number two, I'm interested if uh, anybody has looked at the impact of both high-skilled immigrant labor and low-skilled immigrant labor on African-American employment. I will tell you, in the black community, uh, they wouldn't buy into this argument that uh, low-income uh, or low-skilled immigrants have not impacted uh, black labor because it's, it's very clear, uh, at least from the community's perspective, that it has. Thanks. So let me take uh, two parts. The first is the white national, I can't speak to any of that in the data except for the fact that manufacturing, both in its location and its mix, has been historically white relative to other sectors. And that you know, shock to manufacturing has disproportionately uh, hit white as opposed to black. In terms of the low-skilled immigrants on the black labor market, it's harder to tease that out from trends in general about wage, wage growth by skill in general. And, in, you know, so in communities where there's a large Hispanic population and a large black population, there is evidence, rightfully so, as you're saying, that Hispanic labor market outcomes have been higher than black labor market outcomes. It's hard for anybody to say causal, and that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I just haven't seen somebody can kind of give a test to actually tease out the causal effect on that. But your first order you know, assessment of areas where there's mixed in labor markets between Hispanic and black, and Hispanics have a trend that is different than blacks, that, is, that shows up in the data uh, in terms of trend. Uh, thank you. Uh, Randy Sim. Uh, you mentioned at one point uh, some differences between men and women. And the parts of the economy that are growing are the service sectors, uh, particularly things like uh, health care, uh, maybe child care, hospitality, things like that. Uh, can you speak to whether the historical conception, uh, cultural conception of jobs that are suitable for men, uh, is that something that inhibits the participation of men in the growing sectors? Can I just layer onto that? Uh, they're certainly growing in terms of numbers. Some of those fields not particularly growing in terms of wages. Yeah, we'll talk about, let's go to wage point, because on top of all of this, despite the economy still chugging along, getting better and better every day, wage growth hasn't matched mm -hmm. the trends in employment. So that's a separate issue yeah. that we could come, come back and talk. To. So let me just start with the one other fact that we haven't talked about. I kind of alluded to quickly, that at least is on my mind with respect to, the, to Randy's question, which is, you know, for women, almost, you know, monotonically, consistently, for a century, employment to population ratio has grown for prime age women from basically 1900 to 2000, okay? The 2000 to 2010, or the 2000 to 2020 now, is the first decade over decade decline in participation rates for prime age women aside from World War II. World War II, women entered and retreated um, during the war. Um, but aside from that blip during World War II, prime age women have actually reduced their attachment. And when you look at low skilled women, women, when I say low skilled, that's a judgmental word. What I mean is women with lower levels of schooling, okay, a bachelor's degree or less, or a high school degree or less, the trend from 2000 on 
looks like their male counterparts and were high-skilled women, they were doing fantastic. You could, you could barely even see a Great Recession for women with a, a bachelor's degree or more. They barely had a decline in participation um, during the Great Recession. There was some, but it was small relative to all other groups. So, so the first is there is, I focus a lot on men because the long run trend for men is something you could see easier than women because women you have the participation rate rising for long periods of time. But for women with less degrees of skill, particularly in the places that used to be manufacturing, their life, their employment propensities are falling just like men. Now saying that, there is some evidence, okay? It's coming out, a student at Chicago named Jessica Pan um, had a dissertation very along the lines of Randy's hypothesis that there are certain occupations that tend to be historically more female-based and they are growing more. And as a result, they're not, you know, the women's, you know, are favored relative to men during this time period. I believe some of that is true, but you're also seeing more male nurses now than you ever saw in the past um, because people are migrating to, to other sectors over time. So I think the answer is yes, there is some. I don't know how first order that is relative to like the big shocks of automation, which I do think have hit in, you know, men and women uh, to, uh, in both. In low skilled women, it might not have been manufacturing, but there was some in, you know, other sectors that were primarily accountants, uh, you know, bookkeepers, were more uh, also automated during this time period. And those tend to be higher female than, than male. Hi, hello. I was wondering if you had an opportunity to be able to extrapolate your analysis from farming to manufacturing and from manufacturing to service and service to artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and what artificial intelligence will do to the high-end salaries that are currently experienced in the United States for medicine, for law, for finance, in those areas. Yeah, I mean, there is a nihilistic view. I don't know if I'm that far yet that automation will then automate all of us out of, uh, uh, out of jobs. And, you know, there were views that that would happen, you know, for every innovation in the, uh, that we've seen in the labor market o over time. The key is not what the automation does or the AI or anything. It's how we adjust to that shock. There's always going to be a new sector that comes along and you now that might be the making the robots or it might be providing services that the robots can't provide that still have a, a high level of cognitive, uh, a cognitive load on it. It's how the economy adjusts to these shocks, which is the important variable to think about. And you know, whether the adjustment is easy or hard is kind of whether the question should be. Usually in the data, for those with bachelor's degree, either because the degree itself or they've been selected in a certain way to be a certain type to get the degree, they tend to be relatively nimble to disruptions to their employment circumstances. And as a result, when the AI comes in and you know, does certain types of kind of occupations within the hospital, people will move to other types of occupations. And if all the hospital services go away, they move now to the research and development side. So there is this kind of migration towards the grow, you know, growing sectors. And how easy it is for us to do that is really what determines what the labor market outcomes are going to be, both wages and quantities in the long run. And that's why I think in this current environment, at the low end of the distribution for AI is where I think the adjustment is harder and I think that's why we're seeing participation rates um, and all other social things with that participation rates occur in recent, in recent periods. Um, Eric asked me earlier about opioids. I do have some work on that. In line with the manufacturing sector, the places where manufacturing declined the most are the places where opioid use has increased the most disproportionately relative. Now, it's increased everywhere. I'm sure the catalyst was doctors and prescriptions, but conditional on that catalyst, the take-up rate has been higher 
in places where the labor market has been weak. And, you know, wage growth has been si suicides. In these towns where manufacturing used to be very prevalent, the suicide rate for prime age, in this case, mostly white uh, men and women, is extraordinarily high compared to historical standards. The white um, average you know, expected life, length of life has fallen in the last 15 years relative to, a, again, a century of, of trending upwards. And again, it's not for the people with a college degree or more. It is those with co less than a college degree. You're just seeing lots of social um, measures of social unrest show up. Maybe one more uh, audience question? Several hands. <laughs> The demography of Canada is probably similar to the U.S. Do you observe this in Canadian data also? Yeah, and more in Eastern Canada. And because of Western Canada has also gone through these natural resource booms. Um, you know, you, you could say within the U.S. You know, if you go from the Dakotas all the way down to Texas, the labor market, you know, in those places with the natural gas and the... the um, kind of more mining-like activities has been booming in despite the manufacturing decline. So when you see the similar that in Western Canada, it looks more like the middle of the U.S. because natural resource boom is again providing um, types of labor markets for lower, uh, lower educated workers, um, where Eastern Canada uh, has a similar flavor of of some of the manufacturing uh, rust belt in the US. I wanted to make sure we talked a little bit about wages. Uh, mm. You know, we're at historically low unemployment rates. It's been, been low for a, a long time, yeah. and the wage growth is maybe starting to pick up a little bit now. Maybe, yeah. But, but it's not been spectacular. So what's going on with, with wages? Fantastic question. Spent a lot of my time thinking about that. I don't have a good answer for you. I'm going to say a couple things quickly, and then we can open up to other people's thoughts as well. But you know, productivity growth in the U.S. This is, again, we're the ones working. Those of us, you know, uh, disproportionately with the skill going forward, even for us, our output per worker, how much we're making in output relative to our labor market input has been relatively stagnant since the end of the Great Recession. And, you know, why are we getting lower productivity growth now than in the past is a very large I don't want to call it a debate because there's nobody on any side, but I'll call it a discussion. I don't think there's been a prominent reason put forth of why productivity growth in the U.S. has been so low in the last, you know, we'll call it eight, ten years. Um, and, you know, wage growth and productivity growth are highly linked in the data. When your marginal product, how much stuff you produce relative to your labor input goes up, your value goes up and firms are willing to pay you more. So the fact that productivity growth is low, I think that is kind of related to, to, the, the, to the wage growth. Rela you know, and let's put that on one side. On a separate side, when a labor market is tight, when unemployment is low, you usually see the labor market go wages go up just because labor is scarce. And this is just another sign to me that the labor market isn't that tight. There are tons of people, particularly in the low-skilled market, who are still sitting on the sidelines. And that's a reason why we're not seeing upward pressure now in wages is because it's not like the people who aren't working in some of these Midwestern towns are easily going to put pressure on the labor markets in higher skilled um, non-manufacturing type areas. So I think both of those things, the tightness of the labor market means the cyclical part is pretty low and the productivity growth being stagnant means the kind of the trend is relatively low, and why productivity growth is stagnant is something I, many of my colleagues who work on this uh, spend lots of time thinking about, um, and they're still thinking. Who in the audience has some thoughts on, on, on this discussion, since we don't have to Productivity growth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you? I just had a question. Sorry. I just had a question about the productivity point you were making. Do you support the Severson point that the productivity statistics will eventually show up in the data, but they're not 
there. Yeah, I take Chad's a little bit further. That is not really a measurement issue. That is explaining why the productivity is low. Because one, one thing you might be thinking about is there's a lot of productivity going on in you know, tech kind of firms. How do we measure the productivity of Google okay, or, or Facebook? They don't really sell anything. Okay? The amount of time we invest in those activities are relatively large. Advertisers do pay for things. So people were thinking that maybe we're just not measuring the productivity in these sectors today well, and they will show up with ad revenues or something else down. I think Chad Cyrus, my colleague at Booth, has come down now that it's not so much as a, as a measurement issue um, in, in why productivity is, is lagging. Now, it doesn't mean that it won't be there tomorrow, that as we start investing in things, that creates new advances, that creates, um, that creates some uh, processes, um, that'll make us all more productive. So that could happen. But in terms of a measurement, it's not true. I'm going to say one other thing on a, a crazy thought. So, you know, everybody has hobbies. My hobby is my research. My main job is my research. But I divide it into two parts. The part that I think is my main line of research, and then I have side projects every once in a while that are sometimes crazy and pay off and sometimes just die. This one is in the second of those, and it might be dead, and there might be no there to there at all. But I'm working on some stuff now, seeing if I could explore this hypothesis, which is, you know, during the finance boom of the early 2000s, we saw a huge amount of reallocation of really smart people go from STEM sectors to finance sectors. So if you take a look at the MIT graduating class, historically about a third of them would go to finance and two thirds would go to STEMI kind of stuff. By about 2000, 2001, 2002, about 70% of them were going to finance, and about 30% of them were going to, um, to, to, to STEM. Now, here's the leap. Here's where it gets crazy. Not only crazy, but it's kind of crazy. Suppose that finance has large private returns, but very little social returns. Okay, it's a lot of trying to trade faster than you, and we're just splitting the pie. And if I could go faster than you, I get a little more. If you go faster than me, you get a little bit more. And then the pie itself really isn't growing from our actions. We're just trying to figure out better ways to split it amongst ourselves. Whereas other sectors, like STEM, create some research and development that make us all the pie bigger tomorrow. So that's kind of the dynamic part. So if we start moving a lot of people into finance who are really smart and away from STEM, in the early 2000s, and then he would start be innovating in like 2010 to 12, and then those gains from those innovations would be coming around 2016 to 18. By messing up the productivity process in the early 2000s, you could get a period of low growth afterwards. I don't know how true this is, but the one thing I have that kind of points me that maybe it's not crazy for me to keep working on is that there's a missing cohort of patents by young people in the early 2000s who normally would have been patenting like, so think about you know, a 35-year-old in 2007. Okay? Those people are graduated in the late 1990s. Historically, they patent at a certain rate relative to 40-year-olds or 25-year-olds or 50-year-olds. And do this over time, and you could see that there's a, people who come to the age of patenting around um, the start of the finance boom and follow them through their careers, it seems like there's a missing amount of patents from them relative to, to other sectors. Now, quantitatively, I don't know if it's big enough to explain productivity slowdown. I don't even know if finance is purely rent-seeking. Maybe there's some benefit to sharing risk amongst ourselves. Um, but that's something I'm pondering. That was a long way to talk about something I'm going to work on this summer. This gentleman in the front. Uh, would uh, adopting the European model of public funding of college education help in this adjustment uh, process that you described where uh, there is a group of people who cannot afford or don't, yeah. uh, are not willing to make the effort to, to go to college education? Would that help in this point? Let me just repeat the question. The question is, Suppose we go to a European model for more public funding of education. Do you think that would help the transition 
of the people who've been displaced by automation to get the skills that they need to go forward. And I think yes and no. I mean, so one European program that I am a big fan of, which is not quite exactly on the formal education track, but it's more on the apprenticeship track in Germany, where that once you graduate, you go and work an apprentice in manufacturing uh, firms and acquire the skills. Not huge, you're never going to become an engineer, but you acquire the semi-skilled labor that the manufacturing sector is needing in, in, in uh, the current labor market environment. Now, why do we need subsidies? Why do the Germans subsidize the, 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 the apprenticeship program? So why is a subsidy needed? The subsidy is needed because if Eric goes and starts training his workers through an apprenticeship, there is a high incentive for me to poach them once he's finished his training. So he pays the training costs, and then I could take them expo. So you need to coordinate all of us towards the you know, equilibrium of training in order for it to sustain an equilibrium. And so there, I do believe, so one of the policies I do like is, is more of a, you know, a potential tax subsidies for training programs or apprenticeship-like programs in manufacturing to get workers in at you know, decent wages, because they're kind of subsidized, and allow them to get the skills they need to work. Now with that, there's a deeper, and this is where I want to get to now. Does everybody need, what type of skills do people need for the labor market and how much of them are provided through formal education institutions versus other things like apprenticeships? So, you know, we go in our high schools across the US and people are learning, you know, trigonometry sometime in 10th grade. And the answer, does everybody need to learn trigonometry in high school to be successful in the labor markets that they're going to be faced going forward? Some do, some don't. So is there a way to use our educational primary schools to provide another set of skills that could move towards a labor market? Now, the German model is, again, you track. And when you're 12, you go on track A or track B. And that seems a little too restrictive to me to know, you know, I got a 14-year-old at home. And um, when he was 12, and even when he was 14, there's still a wide standard error of which track he might belong to. <laughs> and um, so you want to give people options. But maybe the, the uh, educational institutions could provide a little bit more options for people. And maybe you don't have to take trig. And you could do other types of skills that the labor market is developed. So I don't know how much of it is a constraint is financial versus how much of it is, you know, actual skills that they have aren't suitable for the colleges versus maybe the colleges are trying, you know, having a, uh, not providing the right skills. Community colleges are pretty cheap and they do a lot of this apprenticeship training and there the take up rate is still relatively low um, in some of these communi community colleges. But maybe subsidized community college is something to think about. One more quick question from the audience. Um, so behind the human capital point, I was wondering what your thoughts were on two kind of really um, um, ambitious uh, labor market solutions to the automation problem. So the universal basic income and the job guarantee. So the universal basic income, I view as a policy of last resort. And so why do I view it as a policy of last resort? Is, you know, when you're, what we want to happen is adjustments to take place. And so we want people to be getting skills or migrating to different sectors or doing whatever they need to do to get the labor market outcomes in the long run. That might be slow, but we want that adjustment to take place. In a universal basic income might slow down that a process. You know, if you've subsidized not working, there's no doubt you're going to get more not working in equilibrium. And so the part of me that, you know, wants fairness and equity says that's a, not a bad thing to do to help the transition. But the part of me who knows incentives knows that's going to slow down the transition. So only if I believe we're at the end game where no more transitions are going to come in this dire state of the world where, 
you know, AI just eliminates all types of jobs at the bottom part of the distribution, and there's no more adjustments to come, I think, you know, that could be an option on the table. I don't think we're even close to that now, and I would then much support expanding the earned income tax credit, which then subsidizes work. So and you could make that as generous as you would like it to be, and, you know, if you work a little, you get a huge subsidy. And in doing so, that can um, get people to at least start making the adjustments of where, um, where the labor market might be going in, in the long run. <clears throat> so that's kind of my thoughts on that. Guaranteed jobs, <coughs> again, in theory, this sounds nice, but they can be very distortionary. When we start guaranteeing jobs that the private sector doesn't want to provide, then you're going to put people into potentially the wrong jobs, and that could really have productivity effects in the long run. Now, guaranteed jobs during a recession, that is a different type of story. And Germany experimented with that in the last recession, and I'm still pondering that as a business cycle policy. Because we know firms cut a lot of workers and then hire back a different set of workers eventually, and that comes with cost both to the workers who are let go and the firms who have to retrain another set of workers. And it might be more socially beneficial to, you know, if there's something going on at recessions that is a friction causing firms to get rid of workers and hire them back, then maybe we could figure out ways at a business cycle. So the German model for the guaranteed jobs is more on the recession component. And that I haven't done any work on. I haven't poked enough holes in my head. So I still have it on the table as something that I'm not completely against. Um, so it's definitely worth thinking about more. So I wanted to, to wrap up my last okay. question. If we're, we're in Washington, so let's uh, pretend you're now a Secretary Hearst. And, okay. Uh, you're, you're leading labor policy. You've been asked about a bunch of different policies. What policy? Fed Chair Hearst. Go Fed ahead. Chair Hearst. There right. go. Okay. okay. We'll there we go. Monetary, <laughs> yeah. on the monetary side. No, right? it's all the same. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, it's... Could uh, be. It could uh, be. Um, what are the policies that, that we need to... I mean, we already talked. I already, I mean, I've talked about the few of them already. So I, I, you know, I believe in in tax subsidized apprenticeships in the manufacturing. Uh, I believe in block grants to localities to experiment with, you know, um, a broader mix of educational training, including some vocational types of uh, uh, activities. I'm a big believer in expanding uh, high skilled immigration. Um, again, for the reasons we talked about before, um, I think those are all relatively easy. I don't know how much of them will work, though. I mean, again, the problem, if it's really a group of people who aren't getting these skills at this level, and if it's not tuition dollars, which people, I don't think it is, um, and then guaranteed education for everybody, guaranteed college, that's a very expensive process, given that lots of our children are going to go to school without those uh, without those subsidies. So that's a very expensive. Problem. I am still more pessimistic about how this adjustment takes place, even, even if I was in charge of things. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and all your insight today. Can we give uh, Eric a round of applause? Okay.